YouTube-канале. Дорогие коллеги, спикеры, все участники нашей конференции, добрый день, здравствуйте. Мы очень рады приветствовать вас на нашей масштабной конференции, которая называется «Как книжная индустрия выходит из пандемии. Стратегии выживания и направления поддержки». Сегодня мы уже провели первую панель нашей конференции. Она была посвящена в большей степени проблемам традиционного книжного рынка. И сейчас, переходя ко второй части нашей конференции, я хочу сказать, что мы продолжим обсуждение традиционного книжного рынка, и мы сфокусируемся на проблемах книжных магазинов и книготорговых сетей, а также поговорим о диджитализации книжной индустрии и инновационных инструментов как диджитализация влияет на книжный рынок сейчас, в эпоху пандемии и восстановления книжного рынка. И я хочу, прежде чем мы начнем, сказать слова благодарности нашим международным ассоциациям, Международной ассоциации книгоиздателей, Международной федерации книгоиздателей и книгораспространителей, потому что благодаря вам мы можем сегодня проводить в Москве в рамках 33-й московской книжной ярмарки эту масштабную конференцию. Спасибо вам огромное за ваше партнерство и ваше участие в нашей конференции. И сейчас мы представим всех спикеров нашей конференции. И я хочу передать слово Надежде Ивановне Михайловой, президенту Ассоциации книгораспространителей независимых государств. Надежда, добрый день. Я хочу вас поблагодарить и хочу попросить вас представить спикеров наших от Ассоциации Международной Ассоциации книгораспространителей. Пожалуйста. Всем добрый день. И я очень рада представить, что... Международная ассоциация представила нам сегодня трех спикеров, и я думаю, что это одни из лучших, надеюсь, они будут, и вы со мной, я думаю, согласитесь, потому что первое выступление у нас будет Джеймсом Донтом, генеральным директором двух крупнейших сетей, это Waterstones и Barnes and Nobles. И мы несколько лет назад имели уже возможность беседовать с ним, и я думаю, что наши представители книжной индустрии очень рады будут видеть его снова. Второе выступление у нас Джулия Белграда, исполнительный директор Европейской международной федерации книг распространителей. И с Джулией мы год назад встречались здесь в Москве, она была участницей нашей книжной ассамблеи. И вот так получилось, что год негде было пересечься, вот сегодня мы опять вот в таком формате встречаемся. И третий спикер, который будет у нас сегодня выступать, это Айрис Ханшет, генеральный директор независимого книжного магазина Ульрих Хоффман, член Европейской международной федерации книг распространителей. Вот такой состав профессионалов у нас сегодня участвует. Спасибо, Надежда. Я продолжу представление наших сегодняшних спикеров. Дальше будет выступление Рудигера Вишенбарда, основателя и президента компании Рудигер Вишенбард. Мы очень рады приветствовать вас. Дальше Сергей Анурьев, генеральный директор компании «Литрес Россия, Москва». Продолжит Натан Хау, директор по развитию компании Bit Technology, это аудиоплатформа из Норвегии. И завершит наш сегодняшний день выступление Евгения Копьева, генерального директора издательства Эксмо. И Евгений возглавляет комитет по международному сотрудничеству Российского книжного союза. Таким образом, у нас сегодня очень насыщенная программа, семь выступающих, и я хочу сразу же сказать о регламенте. У нас на каждое выступление 15 минут времени, и я предлагаю, вот в рамках этих 15 минут, может быть, будет возможность там две минуты задать вопросы, и мы будем двигаться дальше. То есть формат нашей сегодняшней конференции не предполагает, к сожалению, большой дискуссии, но все же несколько вопросов. Я надеюсь, что мы сможем задать нашим спикерам. Итак, дорогие коллеги, мы начинаем. И я с удовольствием предоставляю слово Джеймсу Донту, 
Джеймс, мы очень рады вас видеть вновь. Я помню, несколько лет назад вы выступали у нас, у нас был телемост, также в рамках Московской международной книжной ярмарки. И сегодня мы снова с вами в онлайне здесь. Очень радостно вас приветствовать. Добрый день. Пожалуйста, вам слово. Спасибо, что вы нашли время. Мы очень, для нас очень важно, что вы поделитесь опытом о том, как крупнейшие книготорговые сети мира, это у нас Waterstones и Barnes Noble, две крупнейшие сети, как вы выходите из пандемии, с какими сложностями вы столкнулись и каким образом, какой опыт приобрели сейчас в эпоху пандемии, что показало наилучший результат. Поделитесь, пожалуйста, с нашими коллегами, участниками конференции вашим опытом в период пандемии. Set my time so that I do not go over the 15 minutes. Um, I speak um, with the experience of the United Kingdom, um, both running Waterstones, which is the largest bookselling chain in the United Kingdom with close to 300 stores, um, but also um, as the owner of my own bookshop, um, as a small independent um, uh, in, in London. Um, so I have a, a curiosity there of, of differing uh, experiences. Um, and then also um, from running the US bookseller, uh, Barnes and Noble in the United States. Um, I think for me, um, one of the um, interesting um, phenomena of, of this very difficult period has been how the challenges faced by this, these enormous bookselling chains have really been the same um, as the very small independent bookshop that I uh, run myself uh, or own myself. Um, a period leading up to the pandemic when we were finding life reasonably good. Um, we were under pressure from online um, in both the United Kingdom and the US, that means Amazon. Um, and Uh, one of the things that you should all, um, frankly, to whichever God that you wish to address, um, to uh, hope that Amazon does never enters uh, your bookselling worlds. Um, but if you don't have Amazon, you will have other internet and online competitors. Uh, somebody will always fill that void. Um, but we were, prior to the, um, the pandemic, Um, really focused on competing with the online. That is having better bookstores, more efficient bookstores, um, and uh, improving our own online capabilities, um, particularly to leverage the strengths of the physical bookstore um, in tandem uh, with the online experience. Um, and it was working, um, particularly in the United Kingdom, um, much better bookstores, better looking, real concentration on the skills of the booksellers in those stores. And sales were rising, profits were rising, and uh, the market share um, was moving a little bit in our direction. Uh, but most importantly of all, the market itself was growing. More people reading, more people buying books. Uh, in the United States, that was less the case because, frankly, Barnes and Noble had lost its way. It was a very poor bookseller. But the independent booksellers in the United States were doing well. Then we had the pandemic. Uh, we closed in, in March, um, towards the end of March, everywhere. And uh, April closed, May closed, and then we began to reopen in June. Um, for All of us, that is a catastrophe. Um, our online performance improved hugely, um, but the costs of online are much greater. Uh, we did not have the, frankly, the specialist skills to deal with the increase in volumes. Um, so although we were still selling quite a lot of books, we were not making any money. And in the stores, we were losing hugely. In the United Kingdom, there was more government support. 
in the United States, less government support, uh, but essentially a lot of money was lost. What we did in that crisis um, was to remember that actually nothing has changed, that the success of our bookstores ultimately depends on how each of our individual stores is able to connect with its local community and is able to justify why it is more attractive, more enjoyable, nicer to come into a real bookstore, to a physical bookstore, than it is to buy the book online. It's the same book if you buy it in a bookstore or if you buy it online. But we have to persuade our customers that the book you buy in a bookstore is a better book, that the process of buying it in the store makes it more enjoyable, makes the anticipation of opening and starting to read it greater, invests the gift that you give with more value. And COVID didn't change that. We already had to live or die in a competition with Amazon, a competition with online, a competition with also the time uh, of our of readers. Take them away from the television, take them away from social media, take them away from other uses of their time. We were in that battle already. So um, in the United States, whilst our bookstores were closed, we reorganized them completely. We took all the books off the shelves. We rearranged the furniture. We put the books back on the shelves, but thinking about where we were positioning them, the running order of the store, the physical layout, really thinking through how we used this time with no customers to physically improve the stores, but also intellectually make them more coherent and more interesting. We spent a lot of time thinking about backlist, so the, the assortment of titles, uh, not the new books, but the old books, what our history section was, what our biography was, what in each section did we have the right books. And as it turned out, we had nearly three months to do that work. And as a result, once we reopened our stores, they were better stores. And because we have better stores, I think that our long-term ability to withstand the competition of online uh, and to keep the loyalty of our customers uh, will be improved. The other important and crucial part of that uh, work from my perspective was that it allowed me to keep employed my best booksellers. Um, we judged that although clearly the financial cost of keeping uh, the best booksellers employed was considerable, it was an investment that was essential to make. That a bookstore at the end of the day of course, depends on looking nice and the investment in its fabric. Of course, it depends on the quality of the books and their visual display. It depends on, at the end of the day, more even than the IT and the all the rest. It depends on the people. And because we were able to keep our experienced booksellers working in the stores, um, they did not go and work for anybody else. Uh, they did not become demoralized or fear for their jobs. Um, and we, when we reopened, we had teams in place ready to work. That is not to say also that we did not continue um, to work on our overall cost structures and improving the efficiency in the business. Um, I am a firm believer that the head office function of particularly of a large retailer has to be as small as possible. Um, there, are, there are important functions that a head office does for to allow a bookstore, each individual bookstore to work better, 
and we had to preserve those, but we had to minimize the costs. And we continued a rigorous process of ensuring that our, our key, our, our head office functions were being done as well as possible, uh, but also as, as inexpensively as possible. The key priority was to protect the jobs of experienced booksellers in the stores. Um, one of the positive impacts that have come out of this, um, this pandemic and, and crisis has been that we are now much more efficient um, as a business overall, um, but I think crucially have protected at every point the individual store, uh, the individual shop, and ensured that that is best equipped to, to prosper um, as customers return to, to stores. Um, the other positive in both the United Kingdom and the United States is that people have been reading much more uh, during the lockdowns and the pandemic. Uh, for publishers, this has been a very good time um, financially. They're selling more books. Uh, they have more, more ebook sales. The audio is doing well, and they have more physical books going out through the online channel. It's efficient, it's profitable. And one of the keys for the prosperity of bookstores is that the entire industry and, and wider ecosystem of the book world needs to support the bookstores. And in the United Kingdom and in the United States, publishers have supported both the chain booksellers and the independent booksellers um, in a very positive manner. And that's been very important to allow us now as publishing restarts, um, we see new titles now coming into our stores in, in very large numbers, uh, drawing customers back into our uh, stores, uh, that we have been helped through this period of great financial distress uh, by our publishing colleagues. Um, so for me, in, in many ways, um, the challenges, the strategic objectives, the priorities um, have not changed. Um, they've been accelerated by the pandemic, but they haven't been changed. Uh, we need very good distribution and we need to invest in that. We need a really good website, app, online functionality that supports the store experience. We need what we call click and collect in the United Kingdom, the ability of customers to reserve books in store, pay for them online, pick up in the store. Uh, we need good delivery, instant uh, uh, and, and effective customer service. Uh, all of the things that a, a, a website and, and an online presence um, should be able to provide you. Um, we understood already that social media was vastly important to the projection of the bookstore within its community. Um, and that has been uh, exaggerated by the pandemic, but it didn't change that we needed to invest in connecting authors with readers um, and to place the bookstore in the heart of that interaction between uh, the two worlds, uh, whether that is in the bookstore itself or now, obviously, uh, almost wholly in an online sphere. But a bookstore and a bo good bookseller continues to play an essential role in that connection between reader and author. Um, so my own uh, overall sense now is that we've got a immediate further challenge um, of the holiday period, Christmas, uh, the how we as booksellers um, are able to operate through December. Um, in the United Kingdom and the US, that is the key selling period. Um, how do we meet the volume uplift, uh, the sheer rise in sales whilst we have social distancing in our stores? Um, that is an operational challenge. Um, it's a 
uh, we'll rely on our booksellers and our staff to be professional and committed um, and draw upon their vocational skills um, as frankly we do in every other sphere of work but it's going to be difficult so for myself i think we are through the worst um, we hopefully will have been able to nurse our liquidity and our financial strength with the help of publishers we're now in a good place of, of sales returning to the stores but we we have to get through christmas and then look forward to 2021 with better stores um, and i think a a bright future um, with a big positive um, in in our markets where people are reading more and when people are reading more, booksellers ultimately uh, will prosper. Um, so um, I feel wholly positive in that respect. I have used up all of my 15 minutes. Um, I will be here for the rest and answer immediate questions or, or any at, at a later stage. Thank you very much for uh, yeah, your attention. Джеймс, спасибо, спасибо большое. Несколько, буквально один вопрос. Правильно ли я поняла, что сейчас, когда уже книжные магазины открылись в Великобритании и в США, ваши книжные магазины, трафик и покупательская способность восстановилась? Потому что для России это одна из основных проблем. Сейчас книжные магазины открыты, но ни трафик, ни покупательская способность не восстанавливается. Мы не можем вернуть читателей, покупателей и, на, и не, не можем восстановить прежний уровень продаж. Вот как с этим? When we reopened, we were generally about 40% down. Uh, but within our metropolitan cities, London, New York, 80% down. Every week that has been getting better. But still in our metropolitan city center stores, the big ones, uh, we have 50% down still. So no, we're not recovered remotely. Uh, outside of the cities, it is much better. In the smaller stores, in the local locations, uh, in the United Kingdom and in the US, many of those stores are back to where they were, or even ahead. But in the big city centers, it's extremely difficult. И второй вопрос. Сейчас мы видим действительно очень большой рост интернет-продаж. Скажите, ваши магазины показывают, какой процент роста интернет-продаж показывают ваши магазины и каковы перспективы этого канала, как вы его оцениваете? The online channel in the United Kingdom um, is dominated by Amazon. Uh, and when Waterstones closed, and Waterstones and Amazon have roughly the same market share. Uh, but we are all in the stores, they are all online. Uh, we had roughly half of our sales, store sales, moved to the online channel. So a huge percentage increase, 1,200%, more than 1,000%. Um, today, with all of our stores open, the online channel is still 400, 500% higher than it was before. So yes, there has been a big move into the online channel um, and the success that we've had and it's been, frankly, we would not have believed it possible to have this level of sales, um, is very much driven by the content of what we present online. We are able to recommend books and influence readers choices and that's been very exciting for us so yes online has become dramatically more important um, the the problem the challenge for us is that the operational execution of online at very large volumes is really difficult and it's expensive so you do not make the same margin in your online operation as you do in your stores Спасибо. У Надежды Михайловой вопрос. Слышно меня? 
у меня вот такой вопрос в отношении перестановок, о которых вы говорили. Вот в вашем магазине Waterstones на Пикадиле в последние два года произошла вот очередная перестановка. У вас какая-то своя система расстановки ассортимента. И вот интересно ваше мнение. Вот эта перестановка новая, насколько она сегодня, на ваш взгляд, успешна? И в магазинах Барс и Nobles вы используете эту же систему расстановки книг? Yes, there are, there are, is it successful? Yes. Um, we sell many more books when we, uh, when, when we invest in a shop and when we change its presentation. Um, I, I think there are two parts to it. One is the actual furniture that you use. Um, and that we, um, to be honest, as in many things that I do, um, I always try to imitate what the best of, is within the world. Um, we use um, a design that, that's um, adapted from Feltrinelli of Italy, um, who do very beautiful bookstores, um, and with a little bit of, of a couple of the Japanese bookstores added. It's flexible, it presents the books in a very um, well-lit um, and attractive manner. But it's also which books and how you choose the stock that you have. And that is both um, a question of the selection of books, in which I believe that you absolutely have to think through why you are carrying the books that you carry, that it's not about just as many books as possible. It's about the quality of the books and the way in which they engage intellectually with the customer base. And that will change from one community, one bookstore, to another community, another bookstore. And we leave that to the booksellers in each store to determine. So that is, that is important. Um, for us, where we have an ability also to price, um, we, we discount. Um, you also need to um, use the manner in which you discount uh, intelligently and effectively for your individual market. Some people need money off, others do not. So you have to manage your margin in a very uh, careful way. But yes, beautiful bookstores are more successful than ugly bookstores. Большое спасибо, Джеймс. Нет, может быть, короткий вопрос, я прошу Давайте прощения. короткий, да, и перейти, да. Да, э, Вопрос такого плана. В последнее время э, достаточно э, много появилось выступлений и статей по поводу того, что э, печатный формат э, более, э, более для развития головного мозга более полезен, нежели электронный формат. Вот отношение Дональда Джеймса к этому вопросу. Электронная книга или печатная? Что полезнее? I am a physical book reader, um, and I believe that the bookstore is there to sell the physical book, and that a physical book, particularly for children, but through all ages, is a better reading experience, um, and But that is not to say that e-reading does not have its place. Um, and I believe that particularly if you're somebody who reads lots of generic fiction, for example, you just read like one book every day, more or less the same book, crime books, romance, then read it cheaply. You don't remember it two days later after you finished it. Read that online. Read that on a on an e-reader. It's fine. Or if you're traveling, there are all sorts of reasons why an e-reader can be a perfectly good way to read. I will never stand in the way of somebody who wants to read. But for most people, a physical book 
is a much nicer product and I do not see it remotely possible that e-reading will replace physical books. It's simply not going to happen. Да, спасибо. Мы тоже все в это очень верим, верим в то, что бумажная книга навсегда с нами. И сейчас большое спасибо, Джеймс. Я хочу с большим удовольствием предоставить слово Джулии Белграда. Джулия продолжит эту же тему и расскажет о том, как книжные магазины восстанавливаются и какие сервисы и инновации для покупателей сейчас особенно актуальны. Вот чему нас научила пандемия, какие уроки, какие наилучшие практики книжная торговля сейчас используют. Пожалуйста. Hello, uh, thank you. I prepared a presentation and I was told that I can share it online. Would that work? It's work. It's work. It works. Okay. It works. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Да, пожалуйста. Oh, wait. Okay. Does it work? Perfect. Yes, great. it's working. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Great. Um, so thank you very much first to the uh, Russian Booksellers Association for uh, inviting me to speak today. It's the second time that uh, Nadezhda invites me and it's uh, a real pleasure every time. Um, I was asked to share best practices on how to restore communication with the reader. There are no international or European global answer to that because each country, each bookshop is different. And as we were just reminded earlier that bookshops adapt to the community they are, uh, they are in. So I've decided to focus on best practices and examples from uh, a bit everywhere that shown that actually the link between the reader and the uh, the bookseller haven't been hasn't been severed actually during the pandemic uh, when it comes to especially small independent bookshops um, booksellers uh, and their customers remain very much uh, in touch actually uh, so first just a word about our, our association i'm the director of the european Sorry. Hello. Okay. Uh, I'm the director of the European and International Booksellers Federation. Uh, we actually represent National Booksellers Association uh, at a European and international level. Our members are um, chains, independent, brick and mortar online bookshops. So you'll see here a few of the members we represent, like the Booksellers Association in the UK and Ireland, uh, the Russian Booksellers Association, uh, etc. So uh, this is for who we are. Our role is to promote the interest of booksellers uh, at European and global level, and especially to foster the exchange of best practices, which is what I'm going to focus uh, right now. Um, just a small reminder of the fact, which I'm sure none of you needs, uh, knowing that the uh, crisis are severely hit our industry. Physical sales have drastically declined while the online sales increased. And in many bookshops, uh, in many countries, sorry, bookshops had to close or their operation uh, were uh, scaled down. Uh, as we were also told earlier, the future is really uncertain because the Christmas period is uh, coming and we uh, booksellers don't really know uh, what uh, what they can expect because first of shopping habits that customers will have how do they handle lots of people in the store how do they handle social distancing and that kind uh, of thing so uh, there were lots of um, says that bookshops suffered a lot and yes it's true and like many other um, businesses they had to adapt which they did actually quite well. I'm not saying that there are no challenges left. There are a lot. But during the pandemic, we have seen a lot of innovativeness, resilience, resourcefulness coming from uh, booksellers. And we've seen how essential actually they are to the community they are living in. Um, one of our members, there's a quote below, say that reading can save us and now more than ever, which actually proved to be really true uh, over the past month. 
Um, so as I said, bookseller had to adapt. And the first thing they had to accommodate the customer. So if the customer does not come to you, then you go to the customer. Home deliveries have developed a lot. They've become uh, a new normal, let's say, with even you have a picture here of a, a Swedish bookshop, which delivered by Sledge. Um, booksellers also had to um, tailor their offer to customers. For instance, there were more demands for uh, puzzles, board games. So when booksellers tailor their offer to what the customers were expected, we actually saw that they were adapting to the market and the ongoing demand. And we saw as well the uh, development of online stores or for actually bookstore that didn't have one, they created one with the pandemic. So the pandemic really was an accelerator in this whole um, development of, of online. And for those who didn't have an online store, they actually took order by phone, by WhatsApp, by email. So they never really ceased to have this connection with their uh, customer. Um, also, what the previous speaker said as well is the importance of the, the link with the community. So social media, which have actually was, were quite dominant uh, in before, have shown a huge importance now for booksellers to keep in touch with their readers and their community. So in Italy, for instance, you have a bookshop that organized live events with um, authors and book presentation for readers. Uh, the middle image is one of our Romanian members who actually put her story time instead of the shop She put them online uh, And they are reading every Sunday for kids on their YouTube channel. The last one was a quite original um, Initiative from a Swedish bookseller He actually went through his backlist and saw that he had books on his shelf since the 90s that he actually hadn't sold and he actually put them on auction on his website and on his social media. And this proved to be really a really good action, which actually enabled him to really stay in touch with uh, his audience. Um, and there is something that, that we saw really a lot for booksellers was actually the power of the community they're in. We saw a lot of booksellers keeping in touch with, with, their, uh, with their customers. The last quote is from an Irish bookseller who um, doesn't have a website, doesn't have an online store, but she got calls from grandparents who were eager because they could not see their grandchildren to keep in touch with them. And so they, she actually picked books designed for the kids that, and these books would be offered or sent by the bookshop to the, to the, the grandchildren with a note from the grandparents or, um, or, or a little note or something that, that would explain um, what, what was the book about, etc. And uh, actually the quote on the middle is from our other speaker, Iris, <laughs> uh, who actually uh, noticed that, and it's true, that the smaller the bookshop, actually the closer is their connection to the customer. Um, so all this were, were really positive news and positive insight. Of course, there still are the challenges, but this is the bright side and I really wanted to show it because I think it's important uh, to see that, that booksellers are really fighting back to what is happening to them. Uh, of course, bookstores were not alone. They had the support of governments. Uh, you can see here um, a campaign in the Netherlands uh, that is called uh, hashtag I read at home. You also have a Norwegian campaign uh, that was also organized during the pandemic called uh, The Whole of Norway Reads. And then we saw many, many hashtags developing throughout Europe and everywhere, actually, uh, to promote reading at home and to promote reading in general. So in the UK, you had uh, Choose Bookshops, you have uh, Yo Leo and Casa in Spain, uh, you have a hashtag from Bulgaria. So really, the, the Booksellers Association and the governments really helped in actually raising awareness that reading was uh, something that you could do at home during the uh, pandemic. Um, despite all this, of course, we have to adapt to a new way of living and to adapt to new sanitary rules. Uh, I don't know who are the rules in Russia at the moment, but in many countries here around, you have uh, to wear a face mask either in shops or in the streets. You have a limited number of customers in the store or you have only a short time to do your shopping. 
So here are three examples of uh, booksellers who uh, came up with innovative ideas on how to cope with this, uh, with these new rules. Uh, the first one is actually a board game. So on the floor of the shop, you have different squares that actually tells you what to do. So this one is the uh, starting uh, part on the board game and they ask you to put on your, um, your mask, to wash your, uh, your hands, etc. And then if there are less than three customers in the store, you can enter, you go to the next step in the board game. Um, an Austrian bookseller actually used a traffic light to regulate the flow of customers uh, in his bookshop. And then again, our Romanian members, who's, uh, I put an all because they are, their bookshop is called the Two Alls, they actually launch a, a little um, activity for kids who were staying at home to keep them busy, asking them to write story about alls. Uh, and they will actually publish them in a book at the end of the year to, uh, they, they did that to keep children entertained during the, the lockdown. And uh, I think that will be a nice uh, reward at the end for, for the kids who participated. Um, so to conclude, um, again, uh, I'm not saying that everything is perfect and that booksellers are doing great and they have challenges, but they have not severed the connection with the readers and there are positive things happening because booksellers have been able to show this whole resilience. The, the book industry is a resilient industry. It has been, it has been there for, for hundreds of years and, and it's, it's going to last. Uh, I think for a hundred more. So resilience, innovativeness, and resourcefulness proved to be the key over the past months for booksellers. Keeping to engage with customer, and again, do this in tandem using the offline and the online, now that bookstores uh, have reopened. Keeping to provide local communities with access to books and culture, because we really saw during the pandemic that that's what people turn to actually. It's to culture, it's to books, it's to reading. So more and more people are reading, actually, than, than what has been said. Uh, and I, I'd like to share this quote from one of our Belgian members who said that this would be a good time for reading, but also to reconsider, reconsidering our own personal and business priorities in terms of resilience. I think this quote actually highlights well that uh, what was also uh, presented before, that that time that was used during the pandemic to reorganize the stores, was again a proof of how bookshops are resilient and how they can come up with the ideas to actually fight back what is going on uh, at the moment. Um, so I think that's it. I want to thank you for your attention and just finish by this quote uh, from Lewis Carroll saying that imagination is the only weapon in the war against reality. Thank you very much. Спасибо, спасибо большое, Джулия. Позвольте задать вам вопрос. А, э, каков ваш прогноз, насколько быстро традиционный книжный рынок, книжные магазины смогут восстановиться э, после пандемии и показать рост продаж? I, am I, am I... On speaker yes okay um, I think there's not one rule fits all actually because it really depends of course we will see bookshop that won't recover and bookshop that that will have to close but I think it really depends on on how well the Christmas season is going to be a turning point definitely because it's an, as part of the year when booksellers are making most of their sales and depending on how that will goes we're really hopeful for 2021 but how quick, we don't know how long this pandemic is going to last and the, the time is really uncertain. I'm not sure that really answered the question. Спасибо, спасибо, Джулия, большое. К сожалению, не могу позволить больше вопросов. Давайте перейдем к следующему выступлению. Может быть, в конце мы еще будем иметь возможность задать вопросы. А сейчас я хочу передать слово Айрис Ханшит. Добрый день еще раз. И вот мы сегодня как раз сравнивали небольшие книжные магазины, крупные сети. Конечно, восстановление идет по-разному. Арис, расскажите о вашем опыте, о вашего книжного магазина. Вы находитесь непосредственно в связи с читателем, потому что вы представитель как раз небольшого 
книжного бизнеса, как я понимаю. Пожалуйста, вам слово. Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, I hope you can hear me well. Um, it's not that uh, not only that I'm running two bookstores together with my husband in Germany. Um, I'm also for the uh, Börsenverein of the uh, Deutschen Buchhandel. Um, I'm representing 500 independent bookstores for the Independent Booksellers Forum. So um, I have a good network and I've got a lot of uh, feedback from uh, from other booksellers in Germany. Um, well, some of the experience James Dawn and also Julie um, shared are, were similar in Germany. The um, pandemic and especially the time um, of the lockdown was much worse, obviously, for the big book chains uh, than for the smaller and independent bookstores. If we have a look at the naked figures, um, we are almost back to normal, back to the same level than in 2019, especially for the small and independent bookstores. So it's not, not been that bad, really. Um, um, it was obviously far more difficult for the big book chains to keep in touch with their customers. The customer loyalty with those more anonymous stores is not as big as with the shop next door, with the shop in your community. And I think another problem that it was more difficult for the big book chains in Germany was um, the big book chains, they only relied on their um, online um, strategy. Um, so if the customer tried to reach the big book chain that is in her in their town, um, they could not even get an answer on the phone. So they could just um, reach a telephone or a central telephone number. Um, but all the independent bookstores, they were there. They had uh, the phone busy all the time. They were there to, to answer the questions of the customers. And um, a lot of us did same day delivery. So if you order until noon, you had the book in the afternoon because we were driving around with bicycles and cars in our towns, um, bringing the books to the people. Um, and that was, uh, yeah, that was obviously one of the secrets for um, most of the German smaller bookstores getting out of the pandemic, well, or getting out of the lockdown, I, I must say, um, in, not, in not the worst way. Um, well, by the way, what James said, during the lockdown, most of us were so busy delivering books that we would not have had the time to reorganize our stores. I wish I could. Um, actually, when we got the news that we have to close our stores, I, I, my first thought was, well, oh great, we'll have time to paint the walls and to clean everything. But, well, we did, we've been working more than before because um, very, very fortunately, our customers really kept us busy. That was really good. So um, for Germany, you might say the smaller the bookstore is and the more integrated in the neighborhood, uh, the less was the economical impact of those lockdown weeks. And the lockdown weeks in Germany were between four and six weeks, depending on the federal state. In one or two of the federal states, the bookstores did not even have to close. So they could have been open all the time, but they had um, also um, a loss of about 50% of, of the customers during that time. So, um, I mean, I'm not saying that everything has been great for the independent bookstores. There will be a number of bookshores bookshops that won't make it through this year or next year. Um, but I dare to say that most of those were already struggling before COVID-19 came up. So um, my opinion really is that the majority of the smaller independent bookstores in Germany, that they have effectively mastered the challenge and showed great uh, creativity and perseverance. This and the support and acknowledgement and the love we got back from our customers during the last months led to a new level of pride and confidence for the most of us. We, we got um, 
the feeling that we are an important part of our neighborhood and our community and that we are important for the people and that we are worshipped. Um, and I think this is something that we earned during the last years. Um, well, I might, um, sorry, um, I might um, lead you to some ideas and some digital strategies that helped a um, lot of us. I'm not sure how familiar you are with the German system. As in Germany, we have the fixed price system and we have a very good network at, uh, of, of overnight distributors um, and wholesalers. So this has been very helpful. So we know that in Germany we are in a quite privileged situation um, concerning our um, bookshop network all over Germany and our distribution network, because this is really something special and um, not many other countries have it like that. So in, um, in Germany, a lot of the bookstores maybe about 90% even of the smallest ones, they do have a professional and very functional web shop um, because our overnight distributors, they um, have the, uh, the ability to provide that for, well, compared to other systems for quite small amount of money. So um, I think if the German bookstores had not been so well positioned with their online shops before, the impact of the lockdown uh, would have been much worse for most of us. So um, I can only ask you to, if you don't have an online shop yet, get one. It's, it's really it's so, so helpful and so important that your customers can um, find you in the online world as well. So multi-channel distribution should not only be a catchphrase, it, it should be your daily routine, really. Click and collect already is a reality in Germany, even for the smaller and independent bookstores. Um, we have seen, um, as Julie pointed out, we have seen a lot of um, interesting and good ideas and new ways for digital marketing um, and to get in touch uh, with the customers during the last months. Um, also in Germany, a lot of customer, uh, a lot of bookstores, they took orders uh, via WhatsApp and they even gave book recommendations via WhatsApp, which is really exhausting because you have to print it all in. Um, some uh, of my colleagues, they um, installed like a virtual window shopping tour. So they put up photos of their shop windows online um, and put just numbers next to the books so that people could just write a WhatsApp, you know, I want book number 19 from that shop window. Um, many um, shops who usually organize reading events they um, try to do that as well and um, especially now after the reopening with all the social distancing rules we have to find new ways to do that as well um, so um, a lot of us experience and ex do experiments uh, now with um, youtube or zoom and try to stream that um, um, another idea some of my colleagues had is um, to ask all the authors you know, especially if you're usually doing readings, um, through all the years you have made friends with some of the authors who visited your store. Um, and you could ask them to record a little message or a short reading or to give a book recommendation, especially for your bookstore and for your customers readers and your customers they love things like that because um they feel worshipped then if you get an author they might have been you know experience they might have been experiencing in your shop before um and who now gives a book recommendation and you will be surprised how many authors are willing to do that um just because they like you and because you sell their books um 
the example Julie gave for the live reading hours for kids, this is also something that happens here in Germany. We have a bookstore in Hamburg who does um, also kids reading hour because of the social distancing. They are now doing it um, outside the bookstore on the little marketplace every Wednesday afternoon at four o'clock. Um, and they stream it online so that um, the kids could follow that from home as well. And um, what you could also use is the uh, publishing houses. They offer online campaigns for their important new releases. They provide pictures, book trailers, or authors' readings. They, uh, they have, very often they have authors doing a short video um, sequence from the text. And usually you can find all that on the trade or service for booksellers section of the publishing house. Uh, of the publishing houses web pages use them readers love that as well put them onto your web pages use them if you could recommend books via facebook or youtube a lot of booksellers do that as well um oh i have an important note for the publishers here when you do that please make sure that there is a correct copyright note to all pictures etc because it cannot be our responsibility to put the copyright notes onto a picture that you offer us to use for Facebook. So please don't forget that. Um, well, <clears throat> coming out of the, of the lockdown and uh, speaking about the experiences we made uh, since then, which is about since the end of April, so it's quite a few months now. Um, do we see readers coming back? Do we see figures increasing? We do not really have official and reliable figures for that, but the feeling is definitely yes. Um, there was a great demand for books during the lockdown and that went on after the lockdown. So um, a lot of our customers tell us that they rediscovered the pleasures of reading and uh, the pleasures of relaxing with a book or spending time with their children, reading a book together or uh, doing quizzes together. Um, and our experience in our stores here, especially in, in um, my own uh, shops is um, that people spend more money on the little pleasures, I, I call it. Um, you know, people, they can't go on holiday. They um, do have more time. And so they would rather buy two or more books than only one. Um, when I was preparing uh, this little presentation, I was also asked to, to give some advice. What, what could I advise booksellers in other countries? And um, as Julie said, it's very difficult because the situation is um, different in, in all the countries. But I think what's always very helpful is to um, go out and cooperate with others and try to I call it think out of the box. So try to find new ways um, always try to be as close to your customers as possible. Um, we organized bike deliveries in the neighborhood. Um, other bookstores, they um, organized and installed a pickup station for late hours um, in shops that were ha have later opening hours, like a pharmacy or a petrol station. So people can order the book with you and you know if they say oh sorry I'm, i'll be late from work um they could pick it up in the petrol station after you have closed um try to cooperate with um other venues and and businesses to find corona compliant places for live events i know this is very difficult you know for our shops we usually when we have a live reading event we have uh, 50 to 70 people in the shop in former times um, now it would be like 10 to 12 and we all know that you can't do uh, proper reading and not especially not an economical reading with an author for for 10 to 12 people so um try to go through your community with open eyes because you might find something you did not think of um, churches are very good for reading events with corona rules because they are big and um, very often 
especially after the experience of the last months, they are very open um, and very helpful and willing to to open their doors for um, non-church proposals. Um, or, well, you know, one friend of mine, she uh, found a schoolyard uh, where they have a roof. So during the summertime, she could do readings there because there were, was enough space to, uh, to, to place a lot of people. Um, and even if there was a little rain, it would not, you know, disturb the reading. Um, another uh, colleague of mine installed uh, a surprise parcel delivery, which is also a good way to clean up your shelves from backlist because the people, they just ask you to um, send them a package with books for a certain amount of money for a certain value every month and they just tell you a little bit about what they like to read and so they get a surprise parcel with new books uh, every month so that was very helpful and he made uh, quite a, some extra money with that so um these are some of the experience I would I would have liked to share with you from Germany. Thank you. Спасибо большое, Арис. Спасибо за ваши идеи. Я уверена, что они будут интересны и российским книжным магазинам, и другим книжным магазинам, всем участникам нашей конференции. Спасибо за ваши идеи и находки очень оригинальные. А, а сейчас я предлагаю перейти уже к диджитал части нашей конференции. И а, с нами замечательный, один из крупнейших мировых экспертов, это Руди Гер Вишенбарт. А, Руди Гер а, много лет проводит исследования о динамике рынка электронных и аудио аудиокниг. И сегодня я знаю, что Руди Гер подготовил для нас самые свежие данные о развитии рынка электронных аудиокниг в период э, пандемии. Мы уже частично публиковали эти данные на страницах журнала «Книжная индустрия» в нашем предыдущем выпуске. А сегодня, я уверена, мы услышим самые-самые актуальные свежие цифры. Руди Гер, с удовольствием предоставляю вам слово. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for your very, very kind words. Um, I'm very happy and interested uh, in being here, and uh, loved all the impulses that I got from the preceding presentations. I must reduce your expectation, however. I'm not doing a global overview, <coughs> but I'm mostly focused on Germany, Austria, and uh, Switzerland in my COVID-19 special that I want to Present. I have prepared a few slides because with uh, charts and uh, stuff like this, <coughs> it's uh, usually easier. So let me share um, the screen. Rudy Ger, I already включил the presentation. Quick question: Do you see? Uh... Very good. Okay. I see it's a little bit complicated to know that. Uh, I have the wrong one. Just a moment. Something is not really working as it should, and so often. Rudy Ger, это сейчас включена моя мой экран презентации. Я я его листаю. Удобно будет, если я буду. The second. Mm -hmm. No, can can I uh, no I because I changed uh, I, I shortened my my presentation. Can I do it from my desk? Is this uh, is this very complicated for you? Because otherwise, I'm... Uh, okay. So is this okay? Yes, it's okay. You can do it by yourself. Uh -huh. Thank you, thank you. That's very kind. So it's easier for me because I hate to be too long, and uh, therefore okay. What I try to do is uh, add a few very fundamental thoughts and then have a case study, a, a close up in uh, the German market, which I observed, and then have a few conclusions. When I started to work on the impact of COVID, I realized very quickly that um, it's not so easy to say what are our questions because COVID 19, with regard to the book industry, 
is uh, nothing very particular. It's very broad because it affects everything that uh, we are doing, which has been uh, shown uh, from James Gong uh, and all the other speakers before me. But <clears throat> uh, it's neither uh, a unifying force because it hits different people, different organizations, different markets in very, very different ways. Uh, it makes a big difference if you are affluent or poor, old or young, big, in a big country or city or in a small. James uh, made the difference between London and smaller cities, etc. But nevertheless, on the, um, on the other side, COVID-19 is certainly a primary condition that frames our life. And it's very, that, uh, which also has been said uh, already, it uh, very much uh, accelerates uh, things, uh, transformations that have occurred already before. Uh, with regard to the book industry, that means that very many different as uh, aspects of the book industry are directly affected what's going on, by what's going on. It's not only books, economics, social, cultural, it's also the shift to digital. Uh, how books are embedded with uh, other media, other formats. So it is suddenly turning into a very complex um, environment where we have to adjust uh, in many, many different levels. And partly the big challenge comes from that complexity and that fragmentation. So here are, as I said, a few general observations the, uh, the focus on uh, our case study and a few um, uh, and a few uh, summary conclusions. Um, the very banal first thing is to say uh, that COVID-19 has hit us all like a black swan, uh, meaning uh, a totally unexpected uh, event for which no one could prepare and which is very, very deep. Second, uh, we also uh, realize that getting a broad understanding in certain detail also is very hard because we simply lack data at that point. Uh, we have snapshots, but because of all these differences, where we are, what we are doing, etc., cetera, um, we don't have data that are granular enough to understand uh, what is hitting us, what are we confronting, and uh, what can we do in order to find the best possible, possible navigation. And uh, again, something that has been mentioned, I really want to underline this, the real reality check is not behind us, but uh, ahead of us with the fourth quarter of 2020, when the Christmas season and uh, all the year-end sales, etc., together with a high, extraordinary, big output of new titles will come and we will see how consumers uh, handle this. Not only the, the retailers, but also the consumers, because uh, we, are, we must be better uh, uncertain um, if uh, the, the fairly positive, supportive reaction from consumers so far will prevail in uh, the year's end. Uh, on the one hand, because <clears throat> that's the high season of the industry, but also because th this is when many people will feel economic hardships much more directly. Now, what we did for our case study, which we called the Digital Consumer Book Barometer COVID-19 Special, uh, is the following. Uh, we took real sales data from a mid-sized mid, mid uh, German digital distributor, uh, Bookwire, who are doing um, e-books and audiobooks, download sales, as well as uh, feeds into subscription services. So they are the wholesaler, and therefore they know exactly what kind of purchases, downloads, streams, uh, consumption is flowing across their pipe. And we sliced and diced their data together with them uh, in multiple ways by subject category, by uh, pricing uh, point, by timeline, of course, etc. 
and we realized um, quite a few interesting uh, discoveries. One is <clears throat> um, e-books, particularly in Western European markets, have been downgraded or down uh, talk uh, talked down over the past few years very heavily, uh, which doesn't really seem to be consistent with the reality. We saw that ebooks are much more alive right now than many people thought. Second, we reduced ebooks, and I really speak at first here from downloaded ebooks. We um, identify downloaded ebooks with romance, uh, best selling fiction, that kind of things. Uh, but suddenly we realized with juvenile, young adult literature, non fiction education um, during the lockdown that uh, there was much more diverse life in digital than many people had thought before. Number three, uh, audio has um, uh, gained a life in its own right on many levels, uh, including that uh, the juvenile and young adult niche or segment is uh, booming right now. So we see that digital becomes much more differentiated by format, by, uh, by genre category, etc., which requires a much more complex handling because any marketing campaign needs to be targeted by all these factors, which is a little bit of a challenge for any small organization. But also we see when you synchronize your, your, your very smart and targeted and coordinated marketing and price campaigns with the context with, for instance, a major event like that of Black Swan um, of the lockdown, suddenly it can really uh, have a very positive impact uh, on, your on your digital sales. And you can connect with uh, your, your readers and listeners on many different levels. So that is a very powerful moment to learn this. Uh, and we see uh, also something uh, that a uh, few people expected for the book industry, that subscription seems to be gaining traction. For quite a few years, subscription uh, was talked down as something not fitting to the reading and listening experience. Now suddenly by the numbers, we saw that uh, there might be mu much more uh, dynamics uh, in uh, subscriptions than many people thought. A few snapshots from the data. We see this is uh, ebook download sales. Um, so the very traditional digital model. Uh, it was <coughs> growing quite steadily, having a, beat, a peak during uh, lockdown. But the level post lockdown was clearly higher than before. So there, something was happening. Number two, uh, the the way how sustainable or not or short-lived the growth, the increase was, is very different by genre category between before the lockdown and after lockdown. And also at uh, the right-hand side of the chart, you see the impact uh, of specific incidences like good new uh, titles releases or coinciding um, ebook or audiobook releases with um, a Netflix series or stuff like this, or as I said earlier, targeted marketing campaigns can have singularly strong impact. So again, confirmation of what I mentioned earlier, that uh, you better reflect very precisely and carefully uh, what kind of books you are selling and promoting digitally and what comes back. Here again, you have a few snapshots by, um, by uh, genre category, uh, highlighting a few of this, uh, these differences. As I have emphasized, uh, the, the, the children and young adult category being very, very outstanding. The other includes mangas, graphic novels, some education. Uh, that what we learn in, in, in short is that um, much broader 
categories would have a, a, a commercial potential uh, when you understand how to go about it. And that shows the blue uh, back uh, on the on these uh, weekly um, sales columns uh, during the lockdown. When you have good marketing targeted well, carefully at the right, right category, right audience, right measures, then the impact is quite spectacular. And we all know that um, digital marketing is much more affordable uh, than anything else. And here the last uh, chart. Uh, the green line being the in audiobook download sales, uh, the, the the subscription model, and the red line is the uh, the download sales. Um, so you see, download sales had a very short-lived peak, but then fell off to the pre-lockdown uh, level again afterwards. While the subscription has really steady growth. And I guess this and a few other observations that we could do uh, are strong indicators that here new, new approaches might be very impressive. Uh, to sum it up, uh, we have to face quite a bit of uh, more complexity. We have uh, new opportunities and we really have several untapped potentials across the digital market. <clears throat> what it means is uh, we, we need to pick up resources in order to afford experimentation, learning, pooling, working together with others, collaboration models, uh, both with internal and external partners, uh, are really gaining in importance. And here is now the ambivalent message. This is certainly this, this um, Bringing in new resources to, 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 to experiment and to learn is certainly something where larger organizations are in a much advantaged uh, position uh, because they just can set up a little division for innovation while smaller organizations have a much harder time. And therefore, I believe that uh, among all the independent booksellers, publishers, etc., uh, some new ways to make learning and experimentation and sharing of experiences are uh, more uh, are better organized to allow it also to the small guys that will gain in importance very very much in the months and years ahead. What I want to conclude with is uh, I would not bet on a return to normal. I guess the time after the crisis will be different from what we had before. It will be really different. Uh, we need to open, learn, and adapt. And that requires analyzing, going into data, diversify, take control, uh, controlled risks, and look twice. And I underline it time and again to collaborate. Thank you very much. Here are two last hints. Uh, the, Digital Consumer Book Barometer can be downloaded free and the COVID special as well at global-ebook.com. And for more in the debate and also the collaboration of things, you might uh, be interested to have, take a look at rebootbooks.org, an initiative that we just started. Thank you so much for your attention. Mm -hmm. Спасибо большое, Рудигер. Мы с удовольствием познакомимся с полной версией вашего доклада. Это очень интересно. У меня такой вопрос. Скажите, пожалуйста, вот в период пандемии, в период карантина в России очень выросли продажи электронных и аудиокниг. Это действительно существенный рост. А как это как было в Европе? Каковы цифры и каковы объемы рынка электронного контента? Um, as I said earlier, uh, the, the problem that I have with data at the moment is uh, simply um, what we read in the trade magazines at the moment are snapshots. Yeah? And uh, these snapshots are good, and, and, and I don't want to uh, be critical here. Uh, it was interesting to see how 
people after the lockdown returned to bookshops, it was interesting to see what uh, small independent booksellers had in imagination uh, distributing books to customers on bicycles. I knew it from Vienna. Uh, but what I'm really interested, and here we don't have the data at this point, with very few exceptions like the, the stuff that we did, we don't have a more consistent flow because, unfortunately, uh, many distribution, uh, distribution organizations are very, very reluctant to share their, their, their data. Um, and uh, we have tried to form a certain consortium around the digital barometer, but uh, I would wish we had more partners and we, we had uh, a wider um, uh, array of numbers because um, uh, only then we have more stable uh, predictions that we can do. And the second point is very short, as I emphasized, the real challenge will be uh, starting now, between now and the end of the year. Mm -hmm. Sid, I, I have a question. Rudiger, and uh, from your point of view and from your research, what companies managed the best with this crisis? Or maybe what countries? Maybe you have examples which our uh, companies could research more. Maybe you can advise somebody. Um, I guess it, it depends on very different levels. Um, one is already the organization of work. Yeah? Uh, how larger organizations managed home office was extremely different. Within a few days, I had two conversations that couldn't have been more different. One was uh, with a, an organization like Kobo in Canada. They are spread all over the world already before we knew of COVID. And they told me in a very convincing way that already before they had learned, for instance, how to integrate new team members uh, without having them in one, sitting in one office. Because uh, doing new things without having a physical presence altogether is extremely hard. Yeah? Uh, Very difficult. Two days later, I read in Publishers Weekly all the precautions that uh, the big New York houses are preparing for fall because they, in these high rises, it's almost impossible to have everyone returning to work, which is an entirely different situation uh, and, and much more difficult also on an emotional level because when you enter a skyscraper and you need to line up to go into the elevator, you feel the crisis in a totally different way. And I guess that is one very important thing that we must be aware, aside from everything else, we all are very much hit personally on these emotional stress levels. That's one thing. The, the other thing is um, I'm full of admiration, as I mentioned already, uh, about the ingenuity of many small publishers and particularly booksellers. Uh, I guess this is very much where we can uh, learn, uh, again, about the flexibility to adjust. I would be a little bit more cautious in singing the, the song about um, how independents are well-established with uh, online shops, online services, digital, etc. I know a few examples where in small independent book shops are very good at this. I also know the opposite. And here I see one big challenge, and that is not something that the small independent bookseller can change themselves. And that is the infrastructure. I have the observation that the catalogs from the wholesalers, at least in Germany, and Germany has a good wholesaler system, the catalogs have not improved 
they are more and more reduced when it comes to titles that are off the beaten track. Foreign language titles, niche titles, uh, self-published titles. Yeah, And when people want and need to compete with Amazon, when their catalog is shrinking without them being in a position to fix this, that is very bad. And that is something where I guess <clears throat> uh, also all the trade organizations need to put much more pressure on the infra uh, infrastructure and service companies telling them you need to learn how to better service all the small and big customers. That's the second thing. And the third thing is uh, I firmly believe at all levels of the industry a lot, a lot of learning must have occurred over the past six months, and that will go on uh, in fall and winter. And I would wish um, much more sharing, much more publishing of case studies. How did one and how did the other tackle this or that problem? Because um, everyone has to go through that learning curve. And sharing is the most efficient way. And here I don't see enough, uh, enough sharing, um, regardless of which country. Uh, so I guess we should improve on that level. About sharing, yeah? yeah. OK, Спасибо. thank you. Thank you. Спасибо большое. Рудигер, и мы с удовольствием познакомимся со всем с вашим исследованием в полной степени. А сейчас я хочу передать слово Сергею Анурьеву, генеральному директору компании Литрес. Сергей поделится данными, цифрами, аналитикой о том, что происходит на книжном рынке, на диджитал рынке в России. Как себя повел цифровой рынок в России в период пандемии и сейчас? Сергей, вы с нами? Меня слышно? Да, и слышно, и видно. Добрый а, меня день. переводить будут? Я хотел узнать, да, да, коллеги да, да. будут Сергей, понимать, что я говорю. Да, вы, вы включаете русский канал, а вас переводят на английский. Тут двухканальный у нас. Да. У вас русский включен? Ну, да, русский. Ну да, я включил свой канал, поэтому я надеюсь, что меня переведут коллегам. Конечно. Презентацию mm -hmm. вы сами поставите, как вам удобнее да, или мне? Да, да, я сам, да. я сам. Хорошо. Лена, дайте, пожалуйста, права администратора Сергею. А там возможность есть, все, Сергей, включай там, все, все настроено. Я надеюсь, что я включу демонстрацию того экрана. Видно что их не видно. Пока вас. Пока только меня. Нет, я не могу включить экран по каким-то настройкам. Ну, давайте я включу тогда. Давайте. Давайте, да. да я буду просить тогда отсутствует переписнуть. Отсутствует права сейчас да, все. Нужно первый слайд. Я постараюсь коротко тогда рассказать про тенденции нашего, российского рынка, что мы видим в период... 2020 года, ну, то есть фактически по итогам первых полугода, восьми месяцев, по всему цифровому рынку мы видим рост, рост на уровне предыдущих двух лет, порядка 31% будет прирост рынка в абсолютном выражении, что очень сравнимо с тем, как рос рынок в прошлом году и в позапрошлом, особенно с учетом того, что в позапрошлом году достаточно активно рос рынок цифровой аудиокниги, поддерживанный еще и безумным ростом канала Android, поэтому 35% такая достаточно высокая цифра. В этом году аудиорынок растет с чуть большей базы, поэтому темп роста его ниже, но я об этом расскажу отдельно. Если говорить о проникновении рынка электронной цифровой аудиокниги относительно бумажного, то тут вопрос тонкий и, наверное, не очень правильный, потому что у нас есть вопросы относительно того, как поведет себя знаменатель в виде общей емкости рынка, включая бумажный рынок. Но в целом, вот, если базироваться на прогнозах, которые сейчас есть, то временно, наверное, рынок может дойти даже до 15, может быть, даже до 17% в своем проникновении цифровой электронной книги. Следующий слайд. 
В период карантина мы видели достаточно серьезный рост доли покупателей от всех читателей электронной аудиокниги практически в два раза. Но это, в общем тоже достаточно обосновано. То есть первый квартал это было во многом связано из-за сезонность этого рынка, подарки на Новый год, на Рождество в виде устройств, на которые покупатели после этого шли покупать и приобретать, загружать электронные цифровые аудиокниги. А второй квартал – это уже действительно начало карантина, закрытие книжных магазинов, период активного продвижения и совместных акций с издательствами. И, в общем, здесь тоже объяснимо все. Можно дальше. В период карантина вот весной мы делали исследование, увидели, в принципе, тоже абсолютно логичный рост доверия к утверждению, что электронную книгу удобнее приобретать, чем бумажную. В общем-то, здесь никаких сюрпризов мы не заметили. Увидели рост доли аудиокниги продолжающейся, ну и все, что связано с мобильностью, удобством, удобством быстротой доступа к книгам, оно, в общем, получило свою поддержку, вот эти все утверждения в период карантина. Тоже, в общем, достаточно объективная, понятная вещь. Следующий слайд. В целом мы видим сохранение достаточно разного, разных моделей потребления в художественной и нехудожественной литературе. Мы видим, что художественную литературу чаще дочитывают до конца, чем нехудожественную литературу. В этом плане достаточно устойчивая динамика. Ниже представлена в целом по всему ассортименту картина по художественному. А два, в нехудожественной литературе только 25% читателей дочитывают до конца. В аудиокнигах, что самое удивительное, дослушивают аудиокниги до конца чуть реже, чем дочитывают художественные книги. Скорее всего, это связано с тем, что там доля записанных нехудожественных книг гораздо больше, чем художественных. Дальше, чем можно. Разные проценты дочитываемости книг мы видим по даже бестселлерам в художественной литературе. А на тот международный бестселлер порядка 70% дочитывают. Зулиха открывает глаза, сравнимы 68. При этом, например, аудиокниги нашего отечественного автора бестселлеров Бориса Акунина дочитывают, заслушивают 73%, а вот нонфикшн литературу дослушивают, ну, в зависимости от того, насколько, видимо, художественная форма выбрана для изложения книги. 55 до 35. В этом плане тенденция достаточно устойчивая. Здесь вот резких изменений мы не увидели. Дальше можно. Интересно, почему. А, по жанрам. Можно чуть пониже. Там картинка вся основная. Мы сравнили рост популярности жанров и изменение предпочтений клиентов в первом полугодии 2020 года с вторым полугодием 2019. В период карантина мы заметили в действительности, что выросло потребление популярности книг по психологии и мотивации. То есть в действительности люди, будучи заперты в четырех стенах, активно старались разобраться с самими собой, получить поддержку, видимо, из не только художественной литературы, но и из нехудожественной литературы. Активно росли у нас также книги в жанре любовные романы. И чем более откровенно любовные романы, тем больше был темп просто в этом сегменте, что тоже, в общем-то, понятно. А, а вот все, что касается знаний и навыков, прям непосредственно в период карантина получило некий, некий минус, потому что в действительности, видимо, знания эти были направлены. Ну, и, 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 и этот способ проведения досуга имеет отложенный эффект на, на работу, и люди, видимо, не очень понимали, зачем это делать сейчас, если непонятно, сколько продлится карантин. Можно дальше. При этом, еще чуть пониже, чтобы было видно, при этом в сам непосредственно период карантина, ну, я приведу цифры по нашим сервисам, но я уверен, что в целом по рынку электронных сервисов картина примерно такая же. Действительно, все сам период карантина рост продаж превышал среднегодовой, и здесь данные, которые Рудигер показал, они, в принципе, находят подтверждение. В действительности, период карантина был бум, потом, после завершения карантина, а ля карт модель, ППД модель немного откатилась, а подписная модель, она, ну, на мой взгляд, более, так скажем, 
инертная, что ли, да, то есть в действительности подписчики еще должны понять, нужна ли им эта подписка или нет, которую они купили, она с некой задержкой держится еще, да. А при этом был рост не только продаж, но и все, что к этому ведет, это и рост установок, и рост трафика на всех сайтах мы видели, наблюдали, в принципе, и сразу после завершения карантина этот рост он фактически вернулся к прежним цифрам. В том числе нас цифровые сервисы поддержали активные издательства. Я надеюсь, что они не жалеют об этом и смогли продвинуть и авторов, и получить поддержку от цифровых сервисов. Фактически это было уникальное время. В период карантина в течение трех месяцев мы выпустили порядка пяти тысяч наименований фактически в эксклюзиве в цифровом виде, о чем мы раньше, конечно, могли только мечтать. Если говорить о 2019 году, то там было пару релизов эксклюзивного в электронном виде. Здесь, конечно, конечно ввиду обстоятельств, фактически любой релиз он был эксклюзивным. Для цифрового, для цифрового носителя. Можно дальше. По жанрам я коротко проходил уже. В действительности мы увидели пик внимания и интереса к книгам о мировой экономике, о том, что происходит, что может происходить дальше. Это меня очень радует высокая осознанность такая, потребление, чтение. При этом рост популярности книг по психологии, фантастике, любовной литературе. При этом минус получили, с одной стороны, очевидно, книги путеводителя, хотя вроде бы с чего, и книги по бизнес-тематике. Интересно, что в топ-продаж попала книга Джорджа Орелла «1984». Именно почему-то к этой книге были прикованы было приковано внимать читателей во время карантина. Можно дальше. По рынку аудиокниги мы видим в России достаточно серьезный рост. Если в прошлом году там рост был близок к 80% год к году, то по первому полугодию этого года мы видим чуть более скромный рост порядка 45%, но все-таки очень существенный. Я думаю, что в целом Емкость этого сегмента по итогам 2020 года составит 2, 2 миллиарда рублей. А, можно дальше. Интересно, что в аудио-виде существенно больше проникновения книг в жанре нонфикшн. А, в действительности почти что 80% ассортимента, который там продается и входит в топ-100, это нонфикшн. Можно дальше. При этом мы видим вот, по исследованиям, которые мы проводим раз в полгода, вот, э, фиолетовым или малиновым цветом выделено последнее исследование, проведенное весной, в период карантина фактически. А шестая волна – это была осень и так далее. По полгода назад мы видим, что активно росло потребление аудиокниг в весной за счет редких читателей, э, тех, кто читает меньше пяти книг в год, одна-три книги, книги в год, они вот драйвили фактически рынок весной, вернулись к чтению, что в принципе, к чтению аудиокниг, что в принципе тоже понятно, домашняя обстановка, домашние дела, в общем, до недавнего времени фактически прослушивание аудиокниги дома было основным сценарием потребления аудиокниги, ну, не основным, а он занимал больше 50%, так скажем, можно дальше. Что касается сервисов по подписке, эту тему затрагивал Рудигер. У нас есть в структуре группы проект MyBook. Он в действительности показывает, показал по итогам первого полугодия достаточно а, существенный темп роста относительно а-ля карт модели. На 74% был прирост продаж. А, вместе с издательством проводили мы много акций, достаточно интересных, раздавая в том числе бесплатные пробные периоды на подписку, что привело к тому, что в действительности количество пользователей, которые зарегистрировались, выросло практически на 90% в год в году, и почти в три раза по итогам карантина выросло количество пользователей. Но при этом мы видим, что в целом клиенты 
становится более привычной к использованию подписной модели, но тем не менее все-таки у тех, кто говорит о том, что будет и хотел бы пользоваться только подпиской для того, чтобы потреблять электронные аудиокниги, их число практически не растет. Подрастает число тех, кто готовы и покупать книги, и пользоваться подпиской. Можно дальше. Ну и также в период карантина мы увидели достаточно высокий рост популярности нашего самоздат сервиса. Приросло количество новых авторов на сервисе на 22,5%. Выручка самоздат тоже выросла практически на, в два раза, полугодик к полугодию. Что, в принципе, можно объяснить. Объяснить тем, что у независимых начинающих авторов Оказалось достаточно много свободного времени, они смогли вернуться к своим рукописям, отложенным, незаконченным, в общем-то, завершить их и опубликовать на сервисе. Ну и также освободившееся время они смогли посвятить продвижению своих книг на сервисах, позволяющих публиковать книги на самоздат. Тут представлен ниже рейтинг книг по продажам в период, в период с, января, с января по августу. И на первом месте как раз автор самоздат, который непосредственно пришел на площадку, выложил книгу, посвященную фактически нон-фикшн тематике и продолжает занимать у нас в течение года первое место. На четвертом месте тоже автор самоздат. На этом, по-моему, все. Можно следующий слайд? А, нет, не все. А коротко еще подведу итоги. То есть, в действительности, в период карантина мы были свидетелями огромного количества эксклюзивных релизов и проектов на цифровых сервисах. Мы, в принципе, видим сохранение тенденции роста молодой читающей аудитории, сокращение формата книги. Чем меньше и чаще, тем лучше. И переход на сериальность. Видим, в принципе, набор популярности у новых бизнес-моделей и книги чаты, и публикация самоздат, и print on demand. Также активно в первом, в первом полугодии игроки цифрового рынка экспериментировали с искусственным интеллектом, роботизированной озвучкой для того, чтобы как можно быстрее сократить разницу в широте ассортимента между электронными книгами и цифровыми аудиокнигами. Здесь мы получали поддержку от издательств на такие эксперименты. На мой взгляд, это правильное направление для того, чтобы формировать у клиента привычку выбирать формат уже после покупки книги, а не до. Ну и на этом, наверное, все. Спасибо за внимание. Готов ответить на вопрос. Да, Сергей, вот скажите, вот действительно интересные опыты роботизированной озвучки, а насколько он успешен, насколько с точки зрения, как покупатель отреагировал на это, понятно, это расширяет рынок аудиокниг, но насколько это интересно для потребителя контента? Роботизированная озвучка поддерживается системно, на самом деле, технологиями, Google Mobile Service и Android уже долгое время, порядка пяти лет, наверное, лишь, то есть больше, шесть, больше пяти лет. То есть все книги, которые наши клиенты покупают в наших приложениях на базе платформы Android, они могут читать, использовать технологии text to speech которые на самом деле не используют технологии искусственного интеллекта, а ну, или если используют это в зачаточном виде, могу сказать, что в целом у нас порядка 6 тысяч клиентов в день пользуются сервисом начитки текстовой книги в нашей читалке. Это говорит о том, что люди, может быть, воспринимают это не как аудиоспектакль, не готовы аплодировать стоя качеству аудиокниги, начитанной роботом, но они это очевидно используют в каких-то ситуациях потребления, когда по-другому они не могут продолжить чтение, либо а, у них сейчас какие-то проблемы там, не знаю, с батарейкой, с экраном, еще с чем-то, с возможностью а, включить экран и светить в темноте. Не знаю, какие-то есть отдельные с, э, ситуации, когда человеку действительно нужно пользоваться этим. И здесь чем а, более качественно мы сможем начитать эту книгу с помощью робота, тем больше читателей этим будет пользоваться и высоко ценить сервис. 
Спасибо большое, Сергей. Я предлагаю... Нет, можно Спасибо. еще один да, вопрос? Да, 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 да. Сергей, не услышала или пропустила вот относительно детской аудиокниги? Есть какие-то отдельные данные? По детской аудиокниге очень философский вопрос. С одной стороны, это был существенный сегмент, когда книга аудио переходила с CD на цифру, но мы увидели и видим фактически снижение продаж и переток в взрослый фикшн из этого сегмента. Ну, то есть оказывается, что цифровая аудиокнига не настолько востребована детская, как была востребована на CD. То есть, и мы видели примерно похожую ситуацию, когда у нас был отдельный подписной проект под детскую аудиторию «Звуки слов для детей». Мы видели там катастрофические э, стоимости привлечения клиента в разы больше, чем по всей аудитории. Мы видели там ужасные проценты удержания аудитории. Э, ну, то есть э, это какой-то очень специальный сегмент. Я думаю, что с ним, наверное, хорошо умеет работать э, канал YouTube или, и, или какие-то такие общедоступные э, медийные площадки. Сам сегмент детской аудиокниги, он почти что не растет. Ну, во всяком случае, в цифровом виде. Спасибо большое, Сергей. Я предлагаю все же двигаться дальше, потому что у нас еще два выступления. Uh, uh, sorry, да, 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 хорошо. I'm, I'm just very surprised by the statement of Sergei, uh, because in everything that we could see for, for the German language market, children books in audio is going up like rockets. And so I'm very surprised if that is not Similar in Russia. That it's not similar in Russia, and maybe when you talk about going it up, it going up, it also includes a CD market. No? So uh, I was mainly speaking no, no, about only. digital no, no, market. No, I'm not. No, no, uh, I'm not speaking of CDs. I'm really speaking of digital downloads and streaming. And maybe you're speaking about juvenile, not a children market, but a young adult or something like that. Both, but Both. we will follow so, up on this. So I speak in mainly about uh, about very young children, children market, about tales. So. Young adult market is always growing. Yep, you're right. Thank you. Thank you. Спасибо, спасибо большое, и я хочу передать слово Натану Халу директору по развитию компании Bit Technology. Мы сейчас также продолжаем разговор о рынке электронной книги и в большей степени сосредоточимся на сегменте аудиокниг и посмотрим, какие возможности дает платформа Bit Technologies для пользователей. Пожалуйста, Натан, вы с нами, вам слово. Yep. Привет из Лондона. Um, uh, I work for a Norwegian company, but I'm stuck in London, so... Um, Svetlana, are you going to drive the slides? Svetlana, are you uh, doing the slides? Yeah. Okay. So, um, Beat uh, yeah, itself yeah, isn't a public-facing platform. We make platforms for publishers and for retailers. Um, so they can uh, engage customers them, themselves directly. And uh, hopefully a lot of what I'll talk about will um, overlap with some of the conversations uh, we've already heard. So my background now, I'm in uh, technology for a startup, but, but I've been working in subscription for a number of years now in many markets, uh, mostly in Northern Europe. So uh, through Scandinavia and uh, Holland, but prior to that, um, I was a digital director at Penguin Random House in London. So I'm going to give an overview uh, first about audio generally um, and how, how that kind of landscape looks and the impact of how it has changed uh, and where it might need to go next. So the last um, three to five years in particular, it's been well documented, but not very well predicted quite what a boom the format maybe would have had and there are dozens and dozens of new companies appearing 
all the time in every country you can imagine. Um, what's very complex is that there are multiple different kind of pricing models for the consumer to, to think about. Um, and then for the publisher and for authors, there's lots of internal business modeling for them to try and understand. Uh, the other thing I want to highlight is that alongside the, uh, the boom, the rise in audiobooks, uh, is the huge growth in podcasts at the same time and spoken word radio. And whilst to the consumer, this provides uh, a big breadth of uh, entertainment opportunity, it does provide a real challenge uh, for, the, for the publisher, a book publisher, um, about how they tackle that, um, the battle for the consumer's attention. So for years, we've spoken about books battling for the attention versus movies or music. Now, if we look thinking about audiobooks, there's podcasts and you know the real growth, particularly in the UK, of spoken word radio, where an organisation maybe the size of the BBC is maybe in the most perfect position to 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 really push on this side of things because in the UK we don't we don't pay for any of that. You know, it's just free listenable content. Uh, so on to this next slide. Um, I was going to talk about how the, the these models that we've spoken about. So predominantly, uh, the, the way in which people can pay can be a single purchase download. So it's downloading a book. This is very much on the decline in most markets I know of, simply because people don't want to fill their devices with one huge file. Then there's the credit-based subscription, um, which is where you pay a monthly fee and you can download uh, one book to listen to. This is uh, Audible's main model in the US, the UK, Germany and France, although uh, some news from last week is that, uh, uh, you know, the worst kept secret, that Audible are moving into uh, the all you can eat subscription model in every market that we can think of. They already had all you can eat in the likes of uh, Italy, and it was known that it was about to launch in Spain, etc. Um, then Scandinavia is probably the home of all you can eat subscription. Storytel are the dominant, um, the dominant platform. Uh, they're in Russia as well, of course, and they're in tens of other markets growing all the time. Um, uh, but they're, they're not alone, you know, in many ways, I guess they're, they're building the road for other uh, startups to look at. So Sweden, Denmark, Norway, Finland, Russia, Spain, Germany, all have multiple uh, local subscription platforms but they're much smaller, maybe slightly more exotic countries, you know, that we, uh, be, we monitor all the time have homegrown audio subscription models. So I'm talking about countries like Iran or Ghana, Brazil, Armenia, Georgia, South Korea, countries in um, sub-Saharan Africa. There are local audio startups happening. So it really represents the growth and the interest of, of the format but then if you look at countries such as the US or the UK, pretty much there's nothing. Um, and I think, the, I mean, there are a couple of players, but that is about the dominance of Audible and their, their model. Um, so it's going to be really interesting uh, in the months and, and throughout next year to see quite what the impact of Audible um, moving to all you can, uh, all you can eat, uh, what, what, what impact that will have um but at beat we really believe this the kind of uh the congestion for choice is, is actually a good thing because it breeds a healthier competition whereas in the uk there is no competition you know the us there is no competition if you look at a country like germany or denmark you know there's four five major services um that exist competing for the customer's attention just in audio subscription um now, the, the biggest issue I think for the publishers to consider in all of this is the remuneration for them and their authors within that. Um, the most common model, if I was looking at the world as a whole, is revenue share and some hybrids of revenue share. And, uh, and this is where um, the total pool of consumption is looked at and then paid out pro, uh, pro rated off the back of that. But the problem with that is that it's always a fluctuating value attributed to a book. 
and publishers don't like this generally speaking in in the major leading markets for audio that said um in the emerging markets particularly where someone like storytel where this their model is revenue share largely um, where they have gone in and dominated it's set a precedent and that is the new thing but what this has done is really made publishers think long and hard about is this what they want to do and how is this how they're going to approach uh approach audio or if they want to reevaluate how they're um looking at audible um and now so that question coupled with the impact of the pandemic has really kind of thrown our model and how we work at beat into a strong focus because i think uh, it's it's really clear, you know, we, we've touched on some numbers with uh, Rudiger from the German speaking markets, but it, it, where we're working, so across Scandinavia, Poland, Brazil, the Spanish speaking world, the, um, the numbers are ridiculously high in terms of the growth. I'm talking, you know, in some cases up to 600% growth. Um, the trick uh, ongoing is what that means in terms of retention can these startups retain their users and can they manage the churn rates as we move out of of lockdown so largely they've benefited hugely there is the demand for reading um particularly as people weren't able to get to bookshops or if you know in some unfortunate cases the physical bookshops weren't able to um fulfill reading um then people did gravitate towards digital uh, reading and listening. Um, so we at Beat kind of, we sit in this middle ground where we want to provide the publishers and retailers with the opportunity to create that direct uh, link with listeners and readers. Um, but most publishers aren't tech technology companies. Um, so we, we do that for them. Um, one thing I'd like to say, though, is I, I don't think it's as simple as a, a binary conversation. This isn't about people going into physical bookshops or listening or reading digitally. I think there's a, a room for a strong crossover. So some of the projects we are working on at the moment um, are seeing uh, how a strong digital base can drive footfall into physical bookshops. So you may have a, a platform with 100,000 users or 50,000 users that they are people that are interested in stories and reading or listening. So predominantly, they, they will have an interest in visiting a bookshop when, when, we're, when we're able again. So that should be a vehicle to move people in, but it can work back the other way as well. So if you have a strong um, physical presence, then why shouldn't you also have that strong digital presence? Uh, not just fulfilling digital books to be sold online but to experience it online uh, and by that i mean you create a better relationship ongoing with with your consumer so you can speak to them regularly through their device uh, and um, in many cases you remove the if you're if you're a publisher you can remove the middleman of the retailer um, which can improve your margins but you speak directly to your reader you're not relying on on the retailer to do that for you um, Svetlana, can you move on to the, the next slide, please? Um, so I think we largely we're seeing a story continuously where publishers want to stand up for themselves. They want to be able to pay their authors more fairly and they want to be able to study those consumption habits about their readers directly. So all of that stuff Rudiger was saying about if only there was more data being shared, I 100% support what he says. But equally, that, that can be on a more, um, uh, a, a more uh, direct level where retailers should share that more information directly with the, with the, with the publishers. But they don't. We understand why. Um, but when the publisher has this vehicle themselves, they have all of that. So Beat provides uh, the dashboards full of all this data. So the publishers can understand this themselves. They know who their readers are, where they are, how often they listen or read, um, which regions they're in. Do they complete the books? Do they not complete the books? Everything. But this is directly given to the publishers to act on themselves. It's not held by the retailer in the middle. Uh, of course, with no retailer in the middle, 
they can make better margins. But most importantly, I think it's about creating that relationship uh, with, with the retailers. So Svetlana, if you move on to the next one, I'll give a little picture, um, or maybe the next one, please, um, about how we've started that. So in Norway, we power a platform called Fable, which was um, founded by the two biggest publishers in Norway, Gutendel and Askerhaug. And they founded because they didn't want to do the storytell model, really. Um, they were better doing it themselves. And within 18 months, they've managed to get 50% market share um, in rubles. It's an expensive platform. It's, I think, 1,500 rubles a month, so it's not cheap. But in a country the size of Norway, they have way, way in excess of 50,000 paying members. That's the public number. Um, so that's super successful. So we're trying to replicate this in different markets. Um, we go live in another market today. I'm not allowed to tell you where, but it's a big, big one in Europe. In October, we will go live in Denmark with a platform called Chapter, which again is backed by three of the biggest publishers um, where they will market all of their books directly on their own service and everything like I've just painted. Um, and this is something we, we look to replicate. So we will go live in a, one more major European market in uh, before Christmas and then into the new year. So I think really it's about, for us, it's about providing the publishers that opportunity to learn some lessons from the unfortunate circumstances we've all been in, but be the masters of their own destiny. And fortunately, it's a conversation that um, in many countries was already happening. And now it's just become uh, more important to people. So that's, that's what we do. And uh, yeah, I think, I think that's it for me. Спасибо большое, Натан. Спасибо. Я хочу сейчас сразу же дать слово Евгению Копьеву, потому что у него еще тоже выступление. И потом, если у нас останутся вопросы, то мы их зададим. Давайте в такой последовательности. Итак, Евгений Копьев сейчас расскажет о диджитал трансформации издательств, на примере издательства Эксмо. Сегодня, особенно в период пандемии и выхода из нее, связь с Авторы с читателем – это одно из ключевых, одна из ключевых компетенций, над которыми работают издатели. И издательство «Эксмо» эти компетенции запустило уже еще до пандемии. Период цифровой трансформации идет уже не первый год, и я думаю, что пандемия лишь подхлестнула и ускорила эти процессы. Евгений, тебе слово. Добрый день, коллеги. Спасибо большое нашим коллегам из других стран, да, за такие замечательные доклады. Я расскажу про э, издательский бизнес. Сегодня мы в основном говорили про аудио и э, электронные книги, да, и про книжную э, книготорговлю. Э, я хотел бы остановиться на издательском бизнесе. Ну, прежде чем начать рассказывать про Эксмо, у нас не так много времени, я постараюсь кратко. Хотел рассказать про вот эту вот, мне очень нравится эта метафора, что где-то в Африке каждое утро просыпается антилопа, и она знает, что ей надо бежать быстрее льва из соседнего прайда, иначе ее съедят. Ну и также просыпается лев, и он понимает, что если он хочет есть, он должен бежать быстрее самой медленной антилопы, иначе он умрет от голода. То есть неважно, кто вы, антилопа или лев, важно, что когда взойдет солнце, вы уже бежали изо всех сил. Да, то есть и пандемия это показала, да, что неважно, какая вы компания, маленькая или большая, вы должны постоянно меняться, постоянно придумывать различные инновации и их внедрять. Итак, ключевые направления диджитализации и инноваций в книжной отрасли связаны в первую очередь с возрастанием конкуренции с платформами. Ну, сегодня очень много э, видели различных э, презентаций платформ, вы видели достаточно большие цифры роста, и, соответственно, если книгоиздатели хотят да, э, расти, необходимо понимать, что конкурентный ландшафт изменился, необходимо ускорять все процессы. И, в частности, ну, как один из примеров, вы все знаете, что очень растет рынок самоздата, и я хочу сказать, что если издательство не ускорит процесс издания книг без потерь качества, то авторы все будут уходить на э, те самые технологические платформы. И вот сегодня Сергей уже показывал, что 
на первом месте находится сам издат автор да, в литрасе. В среднем вот сейчас, как пример, срок издания книги в России после получения рукописи составляет один год. Поступление денег для издателя да, происходит в среднем в течение еще одного года. То есть очень большой цикл. И вот как пример... Это вот для иностранных коллег один из крупнейших наших ритейлеров, Ламода, с точки зрения их скорости работы. У них, например, ну, как один из процессов, я в качестве примера процессов здесь привел, перезва... оператор перезванивает после заказа в среднем через 30 секунд. Мне лично перезвонили через 2 секунды. То есть это потрясающие просто сроки. И нам, конечно, надо понимать, что э, если мы не научимся тоже быстро работать, то завтра... Такие компании, конечно же, завоюют существенную долю на рынке. Ну и вот здесь я пример привел, это цепочка создания ценностей да, в книжной отрасли, ключевые, одни из ключевых этапов, да, где мы теряем время и где самые большие а, промежутки времени, да, а, на которые отвлекается, да, отвлекаются ресурсы. То есть при взаимодействии с авторами очень много времени в очереди. Мы поэтому внедряем сейчас серым систему времени в очереди на рассмотрение рукописи. Да, время на заключение договора, время на поиск редактора, да, на простой между различными работами. Да, соответственно, время, например, на дозаказы в книжных магазинах. То есть вы не представляете, какое огромное количество времени теряется. И это очень большой челлендж для нашей отрасли решить эти проблемы. Да, либо завтра, поверьте, их решать за нас. Я считаю, это один из главных вызовов и для книгоиздателей, и для книгораспространителей. Снижение срока да, работы над книгой, как это по-английски звучит time to market, да, снижение времени да, представления книги от автора да, к читателю. Если говорим про XMO, то мы, соответственно, внедряем инновации и диджитализируемся практически во всех из этих элементов цепочки. И вот как пример, то есть если говорим про взаимодействие с авторами, мы внедряем личный кабинет, да, где есть данные по продажам и по взаимодействию договора выложены, да, чтобы автор не, э, было легче взаимодействовать и автору, и редактору, и мы постоянно его совершенствуем. Цифровизируем сейчас договорную работу, внедряем электронную цифровую подпись. И надеюсь, что с Нового года вообще мы все будем через ЭЦП делать, да, то есть не нам не будет необходимости приезжать в офис вообще. Да, внедрили специальную CRM. Теперь у нас, если раньше мы по году два отвечали на а, а, рукописи, да, и давали рецензию, то сейчас мы, соответственно, отвечаем, ну, средний срок стал около месяца-2, двух, да, то есть существенно сократили и будем дальше сокращать. Да. Если говорить про создание книги, то мы активно внедряем agile во всех ключевых процессах у себя, да, в многих подразделениях, где-то больше, где-то меньше, да, но процесс идет, и я надеюсь, за год-два мы все-таки ну, получим 70-80% всей компании сможет перейти на agile. Внедряем Big Data в разные процессы, у нас в лаборатории Big Data давно работает, и мы, соответственно, ставим, внедряем это в процесс постановки тиражей и допечатки. Если говорить про взаимодействие с розничными клиентами, активно развиваем Академию книжного бизнеса, да, и, вот, и я дальше вот расскажу, мы сейчас запустили писательскую Академию XMO, внедрили сейчас, сейчас мобильное обучение на платформе SkillCup, это такое приложение в телефоне, где прям сразу к вам на телефон приходят все новости, тренинги, различные короткие видео, да, где вы можете гораздо быстрее получать информацию и о новинках, и, соответственно, получать актуальные какие-то тренинги да, от нашей Академии книжного бизнеса. Сейчас пока мы тестируем ее на, в наших РДЦ, но в будущем представим это и клиентам. Ну, если говорить про маркетинг да, и взаимодействие с читателями, то опять же Agile, увеличиваем охват рекламных коммуникаций для новинок и внедряем жесткие стандарты, внедрили вот что читать дальше шоу да, и развиваем большой, в целом большой достаточно комплекс диджитал uh, коммуникаций. Ну и так, ключевые приоритеты на 2020 год. Это вот Чичи Шоу, поподробнее остановлюсь, да, это 15 ключевых новинок сезона в новом инновационном формате, и мы уже получили э, около более 500 тысяч просмотров, и всем рекомендую, будем дальше это масштабировать. Э, соответственно, запустили XMO Digital, да, пока со скрипом идет, много вопросов, но я надеюсь, что проблему в ближайшее время мы решим соответственно, за счет этого мы ускорили процесс рассмотрения рукописи, и сейчас можно издаться не только, если раньше мы просто отказывали этим авторам, то сейчас есть возможность э, хорошим авторам издаться и в электронном формате. И запустили буквально недели две назад писательскую академию КСМО, когда ключевые авторы и сотрудники, раньше такого не было, да, будут делиться своим опытом, 
и предполагается участие иностранных авторов. И у нас очень удачный опыт по книжной академии, академии книжного бизнеса для партнеров. Соответственно, надеюсь, вот писательская академия Эксмо займет тоже свое достойное место. Так, достаточно большое количество инноваций. Скажу, что непростая такая задача. Спасибо большое вообще всей нашей команде, кто над этим работает. И я вот призываю всех тоже достаточно активно двигаться в этом направлении, потому что чем больше мы с вами придумываем, чем больше внедряем различных инноваций, учимся друг от друга, друг у друга, да, тем больше может быть наш рынок, потому что я оцениваю, в принципе, по крайней мере, по книжному рынку в России, что потенциал минимум вырасти в два раза, если мы все вместе, да, займемся его развитием, да, за счет внедрения разных инноваций, за счет диджитализации и ускорения процесса. Спасибо. Спасибо большое, Женя. Спасибо за краткость и очень содержательный, интересный доклад. Хочется задать тебе много вопросов, но понимаю, что не сегодня. Нет, Уже да, не убегаю. сегодня. Спасибо. Да, да. Коллеги, есть ли какие-то вопросы у нашей аудитории? Я понимаю, что мы немножко вышли из нашего регламента, но вот если позволите, я все же бы к Натану вернулась, потому что мне хотелось у Натана спросить по поводу гибридной модели, Натан, вот очень интересно, вы об этом говорили. Вот можно ли чуть-чуть поподробнее вот рассказать об этой гибридной модели потребления и какой дополнительный доход она может принести издателям? So when I spoke about hybrid models, I mean that uh, startups generally have to find a way of making their business sustainable longer term. So if they are paying on a, a paper book model to the publisher, so there's a list price and they have to pay X, it becomes quite hard for them to be sustainable long term. Um, so by hybrid, I really mean that startups start to play around with different ways of calculating what a a listen or a read of a book is so one early model for example was called chunking and this meant that uh, a, an audiobook would be split hypothetically into five sections um, but one listener didn't have to read or uh, listen to all five I could listen to one fifth, Svetlana could listen to one fifth, Rudiger could listen to uh, three fifths, and that would constitute a read. And therefore the publisher would get paid for a finished book. That's an example of a hybrid. Um, but it all becomes far too complicated for reporting. So a publisher, you know, suddenly receives reporting with an Excel sheet that may be literally a million lines long. Nobody wants to process that. And that's not an exaggeration. I've seen sheets like this. It's ridiculous. Um, so there are just many variations and it's too complicated. That's my short answer. Um, but people are trying to find diff different ways to remunerate authors and publishers properly whilst making their new businesses sustainable. But personally, uh, that isn't for me. I like a nice, clean, simple model, um, because if you're coming from a startup world, speaking to publishers, you have to understand where the publishers are coming from and the challenges that they face in their houses in order to speak to authors, in order to explain to agents and, and pay in a simple fashion. Спасибо. Спасибо большое, Натан. Коллеги, спасибо за ваши очень интересные выступления. Я хочу сказать, что сегодня в рамках Московской международной книжной ярмарки мы провели очень масштабную конференцию, интереснейшую конференцию, но только сам даже, вот, посмотрите, сам охват стран впечатляет. У нас сегодня были лучшие спикеры из Германии, Австрии, Индонезии, Норвегии, Великобритании, Соединенных Штатов Америки, Швеции. Бельгии, 
это потрясающий спектр. Мы послушали лучшие практики, лучших экспертов. И, конечно же, все это бесценно для российского книжного рынка и для нашего опыта. И я хочу сказать, что вот такие встречи, вот благодаря тому, что ярмарка в этом году в таком действительно гибридном формате проходит, мы имеем возможность послушать лучший опыт со всех континентов, со всех стран. И я уверена, что вот этот опыт и такой формат взаимодействия мы будем продолжать. Он очень оказался полезным и эффективным для нас. И я еще раз всех благодарю. Лучше, значит, мы сделаем обязательно несколько публикаций на страницах журнала «Книжная индустрия», а сами видео, они уже есть в Ютубе, и наши слушатели могут возвращаться и слушать это вновь и вновь. Это все выложено и на канале журнала «Книжная индустрия», и на канале, YouTube-канале Ассоциации книгоиздателей IPA. И я еще раз хочу поблагодарить и Джулию Белграда, Ассоциацию Международной Федерации Книгоиздателей и Книгораспространителей. Спасибо большое за это сотрудничество. Мы очень и очень ценим это партнерство и надеюсь, что именно в таком формате совместно мы будем продолжать и дальше проводить наши конференции. Спасибо всем за внимание. Всего доброго, будьте здоровы и берегите себя. Всем спасибо. Thank you very much. Спасибо. Bye -bye. Thank you, bye. Спасибо. Евгений, остановите запись, пожалуйста.